for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer long. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and I wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean singing how marvelous how, how wonderful is my song shall ever be how marvelous Your grace is enough 
seated. Good morning. You guys made it this morning and you didn't melt getting here? Hey, praise God for that. Hey, if you're a guest of ours watching online today, you know, we would really like to get to know you. And so if you would go to bfchurch.com, click on the guest tab, fill out a little bit of information about who you are, maybe some prayer requests so we can be praying for you, we can get to know you. But we would love to see you and meet you here in person. And someday when you join us in person as a first time guest, we would have a gift for you. So come join us sometime. Right now, for those who are here in person, we would like to meet you, greet you. We'd like to say good morning. So at this time, let's stand up. Let's greet everybody. You'll return to your chairs, remain standing. We're going to go to the Lord in a word of, of prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning. God, we thank you for the rain. God, maybe not too much rain, but we thank you for that rain that you bring us. Father God, we ask that you open hearts this morning to receive your word. Father God, I also ask that you open hearts to, to place a name on our hearts and on our minds of who we can invite. God, to church, to the invite your one. God, that we can start working on them. We can start getting to know who they are, start building that relationship so that they would join us at church. Father God, we thank you that we can meet in this place. We can worship you in this place. Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make this wretch a treasure How great the pain of searing loss 
The father turns his face away His wounds which mar the chosen ones Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished Praise the Lord. So glad that Sarah's with us again this week. Why don't you have a seat? There's a song that she wrote. I'm going to share with you, Gaz and Marcus. Uh, the song that we're going to do, Marcus and I wrote, it's called Rise Up. It's not in that key. Um, anyway, it says when you feel that the road is too long and you're too tired to carry on and no one sees the tears you cry, if you're sitting there this morning and you understand that, that no one has seen your tears, maybe not your wife, not your husband, not your children, maybe no one even closest to you knows what's going on. This song is for you and it is the call to let go of the pain and rise up. So it's called Rise Up. We're going to sing it for you this morning. And when you feel the world's too long and you're too tired to carry on, and no one sees the tears you cry. You're just waiting on a change And when the pain you carried so long Makes you forget what you've always known And when you know it better than yourself You feel so far from home oh, right. With the wings of evil, 
remember there's a battle for your soul And don't forget when the darkness unfolds You carry the light that powers the sun Rise up, your time has come Amen, amen. How, how's everybody doing this morning? Amen. At least one person is. Amen. So this morning, I, you know, you're probably wondering already, okay, what's this uh, sermon about? So the question is, are you a buffalo or a cow? Um, you know, it's crazy what fear does to us. It's crazy that something that, that seemingly is harmless becomes our biggest bully. It, it gains power that it shouldn't have. I walk around a lot, so I'm going to move some of this stuff. A little housekeeping here. I'm going to trip over myself. Um, you know, there's circumstances in our life that grip us with fear. And, and, and to say that somebody that I don't fear is lying to yourself because we all fear. That's when our, you know, it's in these difficult times that we can't think straight. It's that whole fight or flight mentality. It causes us to be anxious. It causes us to be apprehensive about making that next decision, about taking that next step. That's what fear does to us. Did you know that there are over 400 identified phobias? 400. Phobia is the Greek word for fear, and it refers to a panic or fear of a, of a specific situation or thing. In these extreme cases of phobia, it can result in escalated anxiety or full-fledged panic attacks. Some of the top phobias, when I was doing, you know, like you Google, like top phobias, and some of them are brontophobia, claustrophobia, arachnophobia. There's many people here today, not here this morning, because of brontophobia. You know what that is? Fear of thunder and lightning. They're not here because of brontophobia. That's right. Then you have claustrophobia, the fear of being trapped in a small confined space. The number one fear of people you would probably think it'd be glossophobia, the fear of public speaking, right? You would think that would be it. And, and, and so just full transparency, that's something that I suffer from. I suffer from glossophobia. I don't like public speaking. The big, my biggest anxiety when I get ready on Sunday mornings is about 30 minutes before I'm, I come up. 
It is the, and, and so it is the, it, it, it can debilitate you. It can over, come, take over you. But the number one fear that people have is arachnophobia. It's the fear of spiders. So this morning, when I was also doing my research, I came up with two other, there, there was two other phobias that I saw in there. And they're ecclesiophobia and homilophobia. And I pray that during this sermon that none of y'all exhibit those phobias. Ecclesiophobia is the f irrational fear of church. Homilophobia is the irrational fear of sermons. Now, sometimes that's your sin, right? Sometimes that's, that's just, you know, good old-fashioned, hey, God's trying to tell you something. But I pray that you don't experience some irrational fear of the sermon this morning because that is what we're going to be talking about. It's going to be, we're going to be talking about fear, again, because we all have fears. But what's important is how do we handle those fears? What do we do with those fears? The Bible talks about fears, and, he talks, and the Bible talks about fears in three different ways. The first is a holy fear. And so a holy fear, if we look at Deuteronomy 6.13, and all, uh, unless otherwise noted, all of the scripture comes out of the NSAB. But this is what God's word says in Deuteronomy 6.13. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. We are commanded to fear God and to serve him. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ, if you have not accepted the free gift of salvation, then you should fear his wrath. That is a fear that you should be fearing or having right now because hell is real. But for those of us that are saved, we do have a natural fear of disappointing our father. You see, we're no longer afraid of him, but we have a fear of letting him down. Psalms 128, one. Well, let me get, before I get there, let me, so story, right? Story time. When I was in high school, and I don't think my dad knows this, but when I was in high school, <laughs> um, we, we, my buddies and I were like, hey, there's a party going on. Everybody and my friend Janan was like, hey, let's stay at my house. We'll sneak out. Dad, you probably, you remember Janan. And <laughs> he put his head down right now. Uh, he said, hey, let's stay, you'll stay at my house. Everybody will stay at my house. We'll sneak out when my parents fall asleep. And I was like, man, I said, I, I, don't, I don't know. And everybody was starting to tease me. Like, why are you afraid? Why are you scared? I was like, I'm not scared of sneaking out. Because if I wanted to sneak out, I'd sneak out of my own house. I'm not afraid of sneaking out. What I'm afraid of is letting my parents down. Because, see, in the military, especially at Fort Knox, minors had a curfew. And it was midnight. And if the MPs, the military police, picked you up, See, they didn't call your parents. They called your parents commanding officers. And then they called your parent who was in the military. And once they got called on the carpet, then they talked to you. And so my fear was letting my dad down. I didn't want to let him down. I didn't want to let my mom down. I wasn't afraid of doing it. I was afraid of what would happen if I did. So in the same way, we need to have that kind of reverence and fear of our Holy Father. Yeah, we could do it. I could do this sin, but I don't want to because I don't want to let my dad down. I don't want to let my father down. That's a holy fear. And so Psalm 128.1 says, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. A holy fear of God is an attitude of respect a response to reverence and wonder. It is the only appropriate response to our, our creator and redeemer. So that's holy fear. That's a good fear. See, not all fears are bad. That's a good fear. The second is a healthy fear, a healthy fear. There you have Exodus 20, 20. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. In his presidential inauguration, FDR said these famous words. The only thing we have to fear is what? Fear itself. 
Man, I tell you what, if they had Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at the time, that would be the, the 15 second video that would go viral. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. You see, the, 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 the country was uh, on the back end of the Great Depression, 1933, right? And so people were hesitant to spend their money. People were hesitant to invest it. People were hesitant to, to do things. They had a fear. And so he came out and he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That sounds great. But it's not true. There's a lot to fear. Those are healthy fears. Mr. Cherry, let me ask you this question. Only a bad electrician doesn't have a healthy fear of electricity, right? A good electrician has a healthy fear of electricity, right? So in the same way, we have healthy fears. I believe that we have... We, that, that a healthy fear of God means that we have a reverence of who he is. And I'll be transparent with you. As long as there are needles and tall buildings, I will have healthy fears. I will never, ever, ever get a tattoo. Not that I don't think they're cool and I would love to, but you know what is involved in ta getting a tattoo? Needles. I will never get a needle or, or a tattoo because I can't do needles. I will faint. Sophia still has to hold my hand when they have to draw blood. And tall buildings, don't get me, don't get me on a tall building. And it's not so much the heights, it's the landing that bothers me. And see, we have to have healthy fears. As parents, we teach our children what? To have fear of certain things that might burn us, shock us, stick us, cut us, break our bones. And also... Not to act up in school. Our boys knew that Sophia and I were just crazy enough to say to do what we said we were going to do. We told them, act up in school. Go ahead. See what happens. See if I don't follow you to every class. See if, see if I don't act, act, act like, you know, and raise your hand for you. You see, that's a healthy fear. Of re uh, having reverence to our parents, uh, and, 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 you know, that's a good fear as well. It's not that they're afraid, our boys were afraid of us, but they knew they had a healthy fear of, who, of what we said we would do. Job 28, 28 says, And to the man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is, wis that is wisdom. See, healthy fear is wisdom. Just like an electrician knows what electricity can do, that's wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. In this verse, we see that fear of the Lord is equated to true wisdom. We treat him with the highest respect of who he is, our creator and the creator of the universe. You know, so many times people try to, to usurp that, that title of creator of the universe and, things that, and say things were just created. Well, you can't have things that just appear things can't just be created without a creator and that's a healthy fear of who god is so the bible speaks of holy fear and healthy fears and these fears again are not debilitating these fears are not destructive they build the body they get you they bring you closer to god they move us to cling closer to jesus in desperate in desperate times, and it preserves our faith and our trust. You see, our dependence in God through faith in Jesus Christ, it produces joy. So those fears, that healthy fear and that holy fear, it produces joy of who he is and who we have inside of us. 1 Peter 1.8 says this, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Fear of the Lord is holy. Fear of the Lord is healthy. But then there's a third type of fear. And this third type of fear, it, it, it's hurtful. It's harmful, not only to you, but to the body. This hurtful fear debilitates us. This hurtful fear doesn't bring us closer to the Lord. 
It takes us further away from the Lord. In 2 Timothy 1, 7, Paul wrote this. He said, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So I always like to go back and, or go and look it up what other translations say. And so the, C, the, the, NS, the NSV, the English Standard Version says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The contemporary English version, God's spirit doesn't make cowards out of us. Now, you might not understand the King James. You might not understand the, the NSAB. You might not understand the ESV. You might not understand the NIV. But the CEV says, God's spirit doesn't make cowards out of us. Because of who is in us. It says the spirit gives us power, love, and self-control. That hurtful fear is a spirit of fear. When fear controls us instead of us controlling our fears, that's when we become immobilized. That's when we become paralyzed. We become cowards to fear. We allow ourselves not to trust God. And so why do we live in this spirit of fear? If we allow ourselves to be overcome with a spirit of fear, our fears victimize us. They neutralize us. And they immobilize us. These fears don't let us do what God has called us to do. So the question is, what is the source of these hurtful fears? Anybody got any answers on that one? Paul tells us what, it, Paul tells us what it's not. Paul tells us that God gives, does not give us a spirit of fear. So there's only one other alternative. If God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, what does? Sin. Our sin nature, Satan, that's what gives us a spirit of fear. Satan loves to give us fear. He loves to give us, puts a, you know, he loves getting us to agonize over fear. He loves to, to, to put just enough doubt in our mind to where we don't trust in the Lord. So how do we use the spirit of fear? How does he use the spirit of fear against us? First one is by making us miserable. First John 4, 18 out of the message says, there is no room for love and fear. Well-formed love banishes fear since fear is crippling. A fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is not one yet fully formed in love. Romans 8, 15 says, God's spirit doesn't make us slaves who are afraid of him. Instead, we become his children and call him our father. Have you ever seen a miserable, purple, a miserable person happy? They, they, it's an oxymoron. It, the, the two cannot coexist. One can't be with the other. So here's, a, here's some quotes from a famous person. And the, the, here's some quotes. I was upset. I forgot to be happy. Oh, don't worry about me. Go and enjoy yourself. I'll stay here and be miserable. Now those aren't quotes that I took from people here. Although probably we've heard those things here. Those are actual quotes from Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> you see the enemy isolates us from God. We can go all the way back to, this, to Genesis. Right? Just put that picture in your brain. God is walking with Adam and Eve. And he is showing them everything that he created. And everything that he created is for him. But he gave them one thing. He told them one thing, what? Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't do it. So, like any stove toucher, what did they do? They ate from it. And then God was walking around, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And then Adam said this in 310, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Hurtful fear separates us from God. Hurtful fear makes us fearful of God in the negative sense. It makes us run away from him and hide from him. You see, this hurtful fear 
leads to not being in a fellowship, not being accountable, and not receiving encouragement from other believers. And I'm not saying one begots the other, but over the past three years, we've been fed a lot of fear as a, as a country, as a world, we've been fed a lot of fear. I remember at the very onset of, of COVID, right, Mark, back in March, we get back from Belize, and I thought we left the third world country, we came back to a third world country. And the fear, the fear of the unknown, you could almost call it COVID phobia. And people are still experiencing that today. They're worried. Well, what if, what if, what if? But what's happening is there's a separation. Where's the fellowship? Where's the accountability? Where's the encouragement? There's something special about the human touch that is so nurturing. There's something special about seeing somebody across from you and the facial expressions, the true care and concern that you experience when you're with somebody. A lot of people are still missing that because of the phobia and the fear, the hurtful fear that has separated them from a fellowship, from a body of believers. Yeah, you could watch online. Yeah, you could be in, in, in Zoom prayer, prayer uh, teams and, and Bible studies, and that's great. I'm not knocking those. There's a time and a place for those. But nothing substitutes for being here with the body of believers. And it's the fear, that hurtful fear that has separated us from so many. The second thing is, Satan uses fear to immobilize us from action. In the parable of the talents, we know, we know this story, we know this parable. Uh, the master leaves, he has his three servants, and he gives them sums of money. He says, hey, you know, when I come back, I'm going to want my money back. And, and so this is, the, this is the Reader's Digest version, So right? So he leaves, he comes back. The first two are like, hey, I took your money, I, I, I invested it, here's your money times, right? Multiply. And so he's like, great, welcome to your arms of your master. Well, then he gets to the third one, and the third one says, I, I feared you, I was afraid of you, I did not know you, you knew you to be a bad man, so I hid it. So here's the money that that you gave me. What did the master say? You worker of iniquity, depart from me as if I never knew you. You see, it was fear. It was that hurtful fear of that, that servant had that made him, that immobilized him. And so, you know, he said in, in, in Matthew 25, 25, and I was afraid, went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. The servant let fear immobilize him. He let fear paralyze him. So when God tells us, hey, you ought to serve. You ought to volunteer for something. And then we say, no, 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 no. God says, hey, use your talent to serve in an area of ministry. Oh, no, can't do that. Can't do that. Because it's fear. Satan tells us, no, don't do it. What if you fail? The enemy will tell us, what if you make a fool of yourself? Well, then I'll make a fool of myself for the Lord. Well, no, you know, that ministry is too small. I, don't, I really don't feel like working. You know, I, I, I've done my time. You know, I, I'd love to, but no, nah, I just, I don't feel called. I don't feel led. If you're breathing, you got air in your lungs, then you're called and you're led. You see, before too long, the enemy will have you paralyzed by fear. I was talking to my dad. My dad was a drill sergeant uh, in, the, in the army. One of his jobs was he was a drill sergeant for a time. And, and many of y'all have gone through, you know, before you could truly get your mosquito wings, your PFC, you know, or, or your, 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 your type rank, you have to go through boot camp training, right? You have to learn how to be a soldier. And you go through training, and a lot of times it's live fire, right? Why do you do live fire training? Why do you do obstacle courses? Why do you march 40 miles? Why do you go through the gas tanks why, or the, 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 the gas things? Why do you do all those things? Why, do, why does the military make you do all these things? You know why they do that? To prepare you for what? Real world-ish situations. They're preparing you for that. 
And so when you get in combat, how many in here would freely run towards the fire? Right? I'm running in the opposite direction. They're running forward. Joseph says this all the time. You know why the American flag appears to us to be backwards? You know, on a, on a, shoulders, on a shoulders, soldier's shoulder, if you look at the, the, the American flag patch, it appears to be backwards. But you know why? Because they don't run. The stripes don't run. And so it's never a, a, a spirit of retreat. It's always a spirit of attack. But you go through these, tra- the, 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 the soldiers go through these, tra- these trainings to charge into the battle. And so there's no fear. That fear becomes muscle memory. When, when I hear the words go, I go. Plus, they don't want to disappoint and let down their battle buddies. You see, fear can immobilize us. God is putting us through trainings. He's putting us through boot camp. So that we could be a soldier for God. But so many of us are still stuck with that fear that paralyzes us, that immobilizes us. God says, test me and see if I will not bless you more than you ever dreamed. Where Satan is saying, but if God does not come through, then what? See, so many times we get that little doubt in our mind. Well, what if God, you know? We really feel called like we need to give and we need to to give what God has called us to give. But then it's like, well, huh, maybe not. Because what if? What if what if I don't get what if I'm sick and I and, and I don't get paid a full paycheck? Well, what if this? What if that? Well, God has called us to give. God has called us to serve. There is no what if. It's just do it. You see, so many of us miss out on the great joys of the Christian life because of fear. Satan will use fear to keep us from acting in faith. When God is speaking to our heart to do something, it's that doubt that comes up, that rings into our mind. Uh, yeah, but, but, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't like to speak. I don't like, you know, I, I'm not comfortable with kids. I don't, I don't, I'm not good at leading. I'm not good at praying. Well, isn't that great that none of that is a qualification to get into heaven? It's just believe, repent, and receive. And then use the gifts that God has given you to serve his church. The third thing is Satan will use fear to keep you from sharing your faith and taking a bold stand for Christ. We're going through way of the master right now in our lift groups. And, And it's great. It's a great research on teaching us how to share our faith. Uh, Did you know that that fear is is the number one reason why Christians don't share their faith? Because they're afraid. But what would they think? What would they say? Then people at work will know that I'm a Christian. You know? Or, well, you know, I cuss a lot. And I cuss a lot at work. And then if I say I'm a Christian, they're going to judge me. Well, first of all, you shouldn't be cussing at work. So if you're living your, if you're living your walk at work, because it shouldn't be like I'm work Gary and then I'm church Gary. I'm just Gary. But so many times we separate that, right? Or, or, or I'm bar Gary, right? I'm one way at the bar, right? And then I'm one way at, at work and then I'm another way well, no wonder why I was going to church with you because you're, you know, you, you, you are not a good billboard for Christianity. If you're doing all those things, you're afraid people will find out. Amen. Amen. So many are afraid of talking to your neighbors about Jesus. Well, because probably because, you know, you might have been like, you remember Tim the Toolman Taylor, right? His neighbor always had the, the you never saw his face, you know. So are, are, are you that neighbor, right, that's always complaining or whatever, whatever? I mean, are, are you being a, a neighbor that God has called you to be? So we moved into our, 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 we moved into our new house, well, it's new to us, back in 2017. And I'd say about two months into our, our house, there was, a, there was a storm that came through and the common fence broke down. And I was like, you know, it was the side of the house where the fence was really not my fence because it really didn't 
close off my, my backyard because it, it, my garage closed it off. And so I was like, you know, is it really a common fence? I mean, it's more, it's more for his backyard, not my backyard. And so Phil was like, you don't want to ruin your testimony after two months of living here? I was like, yeah, but it's not my fence. She was like, no, it's a common fence. So knocked on a neighbor. Hey, you know, fence broke. <laughs> so we split it because that was the godly thing to do, right? And to not say, well, it's not really mine. Because see, if I had done that, how can I share Jesus with them? I've ruined that opportunity to, to share my testimony with them, to talk to them about, about Jesus. The third thing is Satan will you or uh, this, oh, still there, yeah, uh, about the way of the master and, and inviting our friends. And, you know, Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Lastly, Satan will use fear to diminish our trust in God. People fear that they will lose their job. People fear that, that their kids might turn out right. People fear that their loved ones might die. People fear all, I will lose, you know, all these things. If you could think of it, you could probably fear it. But what are we doing when we surrender the fears uh, uh, what are we doing when we surrender to the fears about the future? We're tr not trusting God. When we let our fears usurp God, that means we're not trusting God. You see, pro God promises that we will guide our that He will guide our lives and take care of us. He commands us in Proverbs three, five, and six: Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 say that blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. Look at, just listen to this word picture. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. When we fear the Lord, there is fruit. Anxiety, depression, there's fruit. But it's not the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit that God has called us to produce. So how do we overcome this fear? You see, God does not want us to live in a spirit with the spirit of fear. He doesn't want us to experience its terrors, to be under its bondage. He wants us to conquer those hurtful fears. So what do we do when we feel, when we fear? How do we, how do we act? How do we respond when we fear, when we feel fearful? Well, we cast our burdens. Psalms 55, 22 says, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. To cast something means to throw it with all your might out. To, throw, to hurl it. But where do we cast it? To the only one that can truly hold it. And that's the Lord. And what will happen when we do this? He promises, that, that, promises us that he will sustain us. He won't let our burdens knock us over where we can't recover. He's going to take care of us. So we cannot let our fears overcome us. The second thing is that we are to do is take refuge in him. David wrote this in, in, in Psalm 27, 5. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. David reminds us that we have a safe place. We have a safe harbor, a refuge that we can go to when we are fearful. When we are in the day of trouble, God will keep us and take refuge over us. So how can we do that? How do, we, how do we go to this safe place? How do we go to this refuge? By being in God's word, by praying. You know what else is a fear? Is during the altar call. I've noticed this. It's a fear many of us have. Many of us won't come to the altar and pray because what if I'm the only one? 
What if people start wondering, I wonder what they're praying about? The altar is not just for prayer for God to help you. It's, a, it, it's also an altar for you to praise God. It's an altar for you to pray for people that are altar hesitant. So the altar should never be empty because you might be the reason why somebody comes to the altar because you took the step forward because you are not fearful of coming to the altar. Amen? And so... We have to go to him in prayer. We have to seek his face. Confess our sin. And we have to pursue him. The third thing we have to do is we have to replace our uh, fearful thoughts with thoughts of God. God has given us a way to keep our fears from paralyzing us. It involves changing our, our focus. It, it's from the things that are causing us fear to thoughts of God. Be in God's word. Pray with brothers and sisters. Listen to biblical podcasts. Listen to sermons. Be surrounded and wrapped around God's word. Philippians 4, 6 and 8 in the NLT says this. Don't worry about anything. It said pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. When, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of his praise. I love these verses. They promise us that if we cast all our anxieties onto him and our fears onto God, then our hearts and our minds will be guarded by God. A peace that passes all understanding. A peace that doesn't make sense to us. But we know it's there. A peace that God brings to those who offer him all that they are anxious about and let him take them. Instead of thinking about all the things that are causing us fear, Paul teaches us that we should think about whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. And so in our normal day, right, here, here we are, there are a lot of things in our life that, that cause us stress, right? School, come on, this working, um, so there's school. This is not open. That's why it's not doing it. So it's like Pastor Joe taking a drink. Say, somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> That's right. And anybody got amen. There we go. All right. Amen. Amen. So you have school, right? And then that's fear, right? And then our jobs, fearful, right? our kids, our marriage, our finances, our house. And sometimes we're worried and fear just about fear itself. Just all of this just clouds us. And so life becomes cloudy, becomes murky. But see, when we seek after the Lord and, and we hear his word, when we're focused on him, when we're in prayer, when we're encouraged and being an encouragement, when all these things work together, when we stop worrying and filling our lives with fear and start with hurtful fear and fear our, and, and, full, and, and make our lives full of, of holy fear and healthy fear, those hurtful fear, fears seemingly go away. And so we're pure and lovely and admirable. That's what we focus on. All that hurtful fear is taken away and our lives are filled with holy fear and healthy fear because we're focused on the Lord and we've cast our cares onto him. But see, so many of us, when we're fearful, we don't cry out to the Lord. When we're fearful, we don't think about letting a brother or sister in the Lord know how they can pray for us. What do we think, what do we do? Oh, I can fix it myself, right? We listen to 10 easy ways to stop worrying. 
right? You know, the only ones that aren't worried is the guy that wrote the book that you bought, right? See, so we focus on God's love. We focus on the security of the believer. We focus on salvation. We focus on God's promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That's when our fears are replaced with faith and confidence. It's in God's word that we find God's promise. It's in it's God's words that we discover who God is. We dive deep into scripture for truth and comfort and assurance. Lastly, we gotta focus on eternity. We have to focus on eternity. One of the reasons we fear is that we forget that this life is temporal. That everything that we're going through, it's just a blink of an eye. It, 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 it's only temporal. Every single one of us was created for eternity. Revelation 21.4, which is to me one of the most, most uh, comforting verses in all of the Bible. And he will wipe away every tear. from their eyes and there will be no there there will no longer be any death there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain the first things have passed away that's comforting you see we focus on the temple we focus on the things here when we're fearful we're worried, many we're probably thinking how am i going to get home instead of focusing on eternity I pray for y'all every, every, well, I pray for you every day, but I pray for you every Sunday. And my prayer is that, that, that you leave your worries, that you leave your stress, that you leave your fears at the door so that you can truly spend time with God today, now, in the moment. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory for be far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul says the suffering of this earth is only temporary. Yeah, it's gonna hurt. Yeah, it might be uncomfortable, but it's temporary. So the next time you feel fear control you, focus on eternity. Are you ready for eternity? So, way of the master, you ready for it? If you were to die today, do you know where you would go? If God, if you went to heaven and, 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 and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? You want to talk about fear. There's a question for you right there. If you were to die today, where would you go? I know where I would go. I have no doubt where I would go. And it's not because of my resume. It's not because I'm a good person. It's not because I come up here and preach every day. Or, uh, on the Sundays that I come and on Wednesday nights that I'm in God's where or, or, or that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know why? Because in 2004, I gave my life to the Lord. In 2004, I asked Jesus, to, I asked God to forgive me of my sins and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. That's why I know where I'm going. That's why I don't have fear, hurtful fear, because my, my eternity is sealed. But for those that don't, oh, there's real fear coming. You think it's bad now. Yeah. To, to quote a, a novel, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> for those of you that don't know Jesus, this is the best of times for you. And so, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you? Because if not, all the hope, all the help, and all the protection that the scriptures promise us, when we are fearful, when we experience fear, you cannot claim those promises. If you don't know the Lord, those promises are not for you. Like I've said before, Christianity is all inclusive, but it is very exclusive. Everybody's invited, but not everybody will come. So that real, real, real fear 
is coming. In fact, you have the reality of hell to fear if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen to the harsh contrast Jesus paints us in John 3, 36. And he says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Amen. And that, we see that verse. And that's great. But then after that, we hear it, we see dot, dot, dot. Because we don't, people, don't people don't want to finish this verse. Right? Because that's reassuring. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. Amen. Don't forget your tithes and offering. See you later. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. If you don't need know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are in direct opposition to God. And that is a fearful place to be. You should fear the wrath of God if you never put your faith in Jesus Christ. That is the holy fear that we talked about earlier. That holy fear of, 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 of reverence, of awe, of who he is. But if you trust in Christ as your Savior, you could claim the promises that Jesus gives us. That you will have everlasting life. Because see, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. I'm asking the band to come up. John 14, 3 says this. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. That's a promise that we can claim as Christians. If you don't know Christ, you can't claim that promise. John 14, 6. I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but truth through me. That's a reality. So many times this, this whole, you know, postmodern philosophy uh, and, and theology says, oh, there's more than one way to get to heaven. Oh, you don't really need the Old Testament. It doesn't jive with today. People don't really need the New Testament because Jesus has changed in time. You know, that's the new philosophy that's going on right now, this whole postmodern philosophy. No, God is the same as he was, as he is, and as he will be. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Amen. He is who he says he is. And if you don't know Christ today, right now, you should be fearful. If you've ever, you know, if you, just, if you say, I just can't reconcile, I just can't understand it. We're not called to understand. We're called to be faithful. So... If you don't know Christ and you want to claim the promises that God talks about in this Bible, that so many authors, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote for us. If you want to stand on that, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So in conclusion, cast your cares on the Lord and leave it with him. Take refuge in his safe and secure arms. Replace fearful thoughts with thoughts about God and his character and focus on eternity. Now I go back to the title. Are you a buffalo or are you a cow? Did you know that both buffaloes and cows, when they hear a storm coming, both of them are fearful of the storm, but they both act differently. You see, when, when a cow hears a storm coming, the cow will run away from the storm. But what happens eventually is what? The storm catches up with the cow. And so the cow, as it runs away from the storm, it continues to always be in the storm because he's fearful of the storm and he's running away from the storm. So he's always going to be in the storm. But a buffalo... He's afraid of the cow, of the storm. But said, instead of running away from the storm, a buffalo will run towards the storm. It'll run through the storm. And what it does, it's able to claim the promises of what happens when rain comes. Water, green grass, peace. So I ask you this morning, in your, as a Christian, are you a buffalo? Or are you a cow? Because it's two totally different walks. 
and two totally different actions and, and, and when the storm comes. Because guess what? The storm is coming. But are you running away from it? Or are you running through it? How can we receive the benefits of God's promise if we are continually fearful and running away from the storms in our lives? Christianity does not offer us an escape from our circumstances. Christianity offers us the ability to conquer those circumstances because of Christ. Amen? So I'd ask that you stand at this time. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to have Pastor Matt come down here, and I'm going to be down here. And, and, and if you're fearful about your eternity... Come now and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If there's an area in your life right now that you're fearful for, for your walk, your, 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 your job, your health, come to the Lord. Come, come to the altar. We're here. Matt and I are going to be standing down here, but the altar is open. If you're worried about any area of your life, just cry out to God. Lord, me. So I'm going to pray. And as I pray, just do what the Lord has called you to do. Father God, we come to you right now. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father, that is due every day, Father. And Father, we stand on your promises, Father. And Father, I pray that you search us out, Father. I pray that you reveal areas that we have not given you, Father. I pray that you reveal areas in our life, Father, that are not worthy of you, Father. And Father, I pray that those, those of us that don't know you, Father, I pray that today they can claim the promises, Father, and have the security of the believer, Father. I pray for those that have walked away from you, Father, that today they come running back to you, Father. I pray for those that are, that are healing from, from medical situations that are hurting or worried about upcoming issues, Father. I pray for those that are worried about their finances, their marriage, their children, Father. I pray that they cast those burdens onto you, Father that you so freely take, Father. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Come. Amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a Oh, you, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a
Man, you may be seated. Um, just a couple of cl- uh, how, closing things. If you, when you leave, um, use the auxiliary gate on uh, Rhodes Road here. Don't use the gate to my right, right? As you exit, don't use the one. Use this one up here, the north side one, because uh, this one's a little bit higher ground. So as you leave, just use the one on the left. Amen. Uh, so that way, we, you know, almost positive, <laughs> you can get out. Or you don't use don't use the twenty nine twenty gate. Okay, don't use that one either. So that's the only way out, people. <laughs> right there. <laughs> right. That's it. One way. And so uh, just make sure you use there. Uh, we have a couple of closing announcements. Um, first one is we have our student ministry fundraiser. Matt, you want to come on up? We'll kind of tag team this together. Um, and I'll let Matt talk about the student ministry fundraiser. I just want to thank you for allowing me to share my heart. It's always a blessing to come up here and just, uh, you know, share God's word. Um, and so uh, thank you for your prayers. And uh, amen, all you, Matt. Yeah, thanks. So, we, yes, we have this, minister, this, this student ministry fundraiser that is going to benefit our kids camp and youth camp. And it's so easy, y'all. Even a caveman can do it. You know, the, the way it works is the amount that you can donate, you grab that envelope, you put that amount in the envelope, and you drop it in the box. And so if you can give, if you can give five dollars, you grab the five dollar envelope. If you can give, it goes one to a hundred. If you can give more than a hundred, then then grab any of them, put that in there, and and drop it in the box. Now, normally with with fundraisers, we do like a, a bake sale or bake auction where you buy an item and you get to take it home. So it's what do you get out of this? You get to send a kid to camp. Like yeah, you know, a, a few years ago, we we sponsored a kid to camp who he wouldn't have been able to go otherwise. And because of the donations that we received from you, he was able to go at camp. He gave his life to Christ. He got home. And because of the changes his family saw in his life, they got involved in a church. His parents and his siblings gave their life to Christ at that church. What do you get out of this? You get to sit, send a kid to camp. So help us out with that. It's, it's really going to... Uh, help them tonight. Yes, it's raining as of right now, and, and we'll keep you posted. We do have our our Sunday night lift, and let me brag on that group. It's a ladies' lift group right now, and they I, I've seen new faces coming Sunday nights who haven't been involved in lift before. So they're man, they're just awesome. So yes, we do have lift tonight. We have youth. We do have a one for our children uh, come tonight, and we'll again we'll keep you posted based upon how the weather's looking. Wednesday night, Pastor Gary picks it back up. Uh, Wednesday night, the Harmony of the Gospels. Guys, come on Wednesday nights. It's a great time. He's leading great, great message. Invite your one. Who are you praying to invite? Now, if you may be like me, everybody I know is already here at the church. Like, but that's where we need to, to make an effort to reach out more. I'm thinking, so for me personally, if I look across the street and two houses down, there's a family there where uh, it's, it's a guy. I always see him all the time. I wave at him. He waves at me. And that's about the extent of the relationship we had. And honestly, I should do better. And I'm going to. So over the next two weeks... I'm going to go find out what his name is instead of just waving at him and, hey, you know, I'm going to find out his name, his wife's name. I'm going to get to know them so that as we get closer and I invite them, I'm not a stranger. And so I ask you guys to do the same. If it's a, a neighbor or a coworker, get to know people, not just the people here in this building, so that you can invite your one. And that is going to be on March 5th. All right, so in two Sundays from now, we have the Soup Herb Bowl. Sunday, this is going to be a Super Bowl fellowship right after service. We have a sign up in the lobby of, of items that you can bring. It's, it's a potluck. As Aiden would say, it's free food. So, you know, you really should be here for that. It's going to be a great time of fellowship. That is two Sundays from now on the 12th. Guys, you can stay connected to us through Facebook, YouTube, bfchurch.com. And uh, also in our lobby, we have three monitors. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but we have monitors out there where we post pictures of the different events that we've had. We also post 
some of the upcoming events that maybe we didn't announce up here. So check out those monitors as you are coming and going. For our online guests, like I said, we do really want to get to know you. We, you know, we're not going to run your credit or anything. All right, we just, we just want to be able to pray for you and, and know who you are, who's watching, so we can be praying for you and get to know you a little more. So if you do, go to bfchurch.com, click on that guest tab. I think if you're on your phone, you have to click on the three tabs at the at the top uh, left of the screen and then scroll down to guests. That way we can get to know who's watching us. Don't forget your tithes and offerings. We have three ways to give. You can give today, drop in an offering receptacles. You can give online at bfchurch.com. Click on the Give tab, um, or you can drop them off Monday through Thursday. We are here 9 to 5. And when you are tithing, when you are giving those, we are keeping track of that so that when you go to pay your taxes, because we all have to pay taxes, we will have a giving statement for you. So if you'd like to receive your statement, email us at info at bfchurch.com and make sure to put your your first and last name because if, if we get an email from coupon queen asking for a, 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 a statement we got to know who we're giving it to so make sure you do that as a reminder i think pastor gary mentioned as you're leaving today exit through the gate over here opposite of that big led sign with that guys you are dismissed mm -hmm.